Okay, good morning. We are going to get started. Is the microphone on? On your side, testing? Is the audio coming through? There we go. All right. Well, good morning. It is another beautiful Sunday. And I can't get the USB-C PowerPoint dongle, and there it goes. All right. It is another Sunday. We are back in the house of the Lord. And we gather together as we do each Sunday as a body of believers, the bride of Christ, collectively to come into the Lord's house to be able to open up his word on our laps and to have the freedom to be able to exercise our religious liberty and learn about what the Creator has in store for us. And how do we learn what he has in store for us? Well, we learn about him. We purpose ourselves to learn, to put effort into our Creator, our Father, and our Savior, and our bridegroom. And that's not just something that happens by accident. It's not just something that is inherently given to us. It is something that we actually need to purpose ourselves the effort, the time to get to know our Creator. So that's why we take this time because it is a blessing to be able to do so. Unfortunately, not every believer in the church across the world and throughout human history has had the, the luxury that we have, which is to be able to freely exercise religious liberty absent from persecution. But we have that liberty in this great country, which is why we're here. And we are going to continue our study in the book of Revelation, word for word, line by line. And let's open up with prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for giving us this time to come together into your house. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you open up our hearts and minds as we go through your word that you bring to our attention those things which you would have in store for us, our learning, and the purpose that you have for our lives. In the name, power, and in the authority of Jesus Christ, amen. All right. Again, we are in the book of Revelation, and we are in chapter 18. We've been on a tangent the last several weeks, as we go through chapter 18, verse, or chapters 17 and 18 have to do with Babylon, Mystery Babylon, and those chapters with their focus are the destruction of Babylon, that great city. And that's important because it's the once and for all judgment that Babylon is due. And they are unique in human history in being the origin, the genesis of spiritual idolatry that has transcended cultures, transcended human history. And even today, if we look around, we see various aspects of the idolatry, the pagan worship, the spiritual idolatry that all started with Babylon. And so it is being judged, it's being destroyed. And so with that, on that topic then, we took a tangent, uh, various parts of God's word. We looked at uh, Lamentations, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and did we finish, we did get to Ezekiel last week, right? I think, I know we were in a hurry, I don't think we finished it, but we at least got to it. Just giving different examples of, of the seriousness by which God, our creator, holds that we stay faithful to him, that we honor him. And he uses what we're familiar with, the marital relationship between husband and wife, 
to help us understand the aspects of the relationship we have to him. And when that, when there's a violation, it's as if there's an adultery taking place, fornication, in a spiritual sense. That's how seriousness he considers it, because he's looking for our worship of him, not, obviously, of pagan and idol worship. So, that's where we left off, and we will move on then. We'll move on to our next tangent. Now, for those, how many in here, this would have been over a year and a half ago, but how many here uh, were part of the, the study we did in the book of Zechariah? I see one hand. Two hands, okay. So there's two of you out of this entire room. There's two people that went through the book of Zechariah with us. But uh, this slide, I just pulled several slides from the book of Zechariah because they're very pertinent to this, this continued study of uh, Revelation 17 and 18. And for those, so this, even though this is a slide pulled from that study, then it sounds like all except for two of you are not familiar with this slide. But this is a slide that we're not going to have time to go through it all because we obviously did this through when we were in Zechariah. But I wanted to draw your attention to one of the, the, the prophecies or vision. Not, uh, well, it is prophecy, but it's a vision uh, in Zechariah chapter 5, beginning in verse 5. And so Zechariah, by means of background, he, there's a series of visions that Zechariah is given. A series of visions. And uh, I'm trying to recount here how many, I think it's 12 visions. I'm looking at my notes here in the margins. I see nine, maybe it's only 10 visions, 10, 12. But nevertheless, it's a series of visions. And one of those visions is chapter 5, verses 5 through 11. So let's take a look at that. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes, and see what is this that goeth forth. Okay, so here's a vision. The angel is showing Zechariah a series of things. This is one of those things. He's saying, okay, look, and uh, uh, let's take, in a, uh, take a look at what you see. Verse 6, And I said, What is it? And he, this is the angel now, and he said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, Moreover, this is their resemblance through all earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this, is a, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. So you have an ephah, and then you have a talent of lead. So envision what's happening here. Question? Oh, we're, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. So uh, an ephah is, uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll just say it right now, so you can get an understanding of what's happening here. An ephah is a basket. And there's a woman that is inside of this basket. And then a talent of lead, so it's a lead lid. So a lid made of lead weighing a talent, and talent is, is a unit of measurement. Uh, sitteth in the midst of the ephah. So the woman's in the midst of the ephah, verse 7, verse 8. And he said, this is wickedness. Does a woman depicting wickedness Ring familiar. Yes. Say it again. Yes, the horror of Babylon, exactly. Because that's why we're studying that, right? Obviously. The picture taking wickedness and painting that as a woman that's riding the beast, right? That's what we've been studying in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. So we're familiar with this concept of of wickedness, evil, being depicted as a woman. And that's what's true here. This vision that Zechariah is seeing is similar, a woman, and it's telling right here. And he, this is the angel. So the angel that is showing this vision to Zechariah is identifying this woman. And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it, so the, the angel cast wickedness, personified as a woman, into the midst of the ephah. So you have this basket, and the woman is being put into this basket. And he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. So the basket is open on top, right? 
And so you need to put a lid on there, and that's what this lead cover is on top of it. And by putting the lid on top of the basket, on top of the ephah, what is that doing to the woman? It's trapping her inside, right? So it's trapping this woman that's picturing wickedness inside of this ephah with a lid on top. Verse 9. Then lifted I up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the winds of a stork. Okay, so now you have this woman that's wickedness inside of the ephah. Now you have two other women that had wings like a stork. Okay, so now you have a total of three women now. These two have, women, or have wings like a stork. And they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. So wherever this ephah was sitting with the woman inside in a, in a, uh, a lead lid weighing a talon sitting on top of it, these two women with wings of a stork picked it up and it's now flying between earth, the ground, and heaven. There's three heavens, right? What are the three heavens? The first heaven is the heaven that the birds fly in. The second heaven is the heaven that the stars are in. And then what's the third heaven? Where the throne room of the universe resides, right? So he would be saying, so we would say the sky. So this, this basket is being lifted up into the sky by these two women with wings of a stork. And they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. And said I to the angel, what talked with me? Or, I'm sorry. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, whither do these bear the ephah? So in other words, what are they doing with this? What are they, where is it going? And he said unto me, to build it an house in the land of Shinar. What is that? Does that ring familiar in your ears? Babylon. So Shinar, the plain of Shinar, is where Babylon exists. Babylon's a city. Shinar is more of a region. Okay, so they're, but they're, they're used synonymously in the Bible. When you, think, when you think Shinar, think of Babel. When you think of Babel, think of Shinar. Okay, so this, this basket now with wickedness inside is being carried, and, he's, and the angel is saying, to build it an house in the land of Shinar, and it, estab- and, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. Okay, interesting. And that's it. That's the end of the vision. Kind of an odd thing, right? Kind of an odd thing. But there are things here that help to connect the dots. Because as we have said over and over in this study, the Bible, God's Word, is 66 separate books, right? Compiled between two covers. But there are 66 individual books in here, right? 66 individual books that have been compiled together between two covers, and we call that the Bible. And those 66 individual books are penned by over 40 penmen, spanning thousands of years. But yet, it's an integrated message because the author is the same. The author is our creator, the Holy Spirit. And when we see this integration now, with a woman identified as wickedness. That rings familiar in our ears because of Revelation 17 and 18. When we see Shinar, that rings familiar in our ears because of Babylon. And so we have Babylon and the woman in Revelation 17 and 18, which is why we're on this tangent right now. So, I don't want to get into, again, this, I don't want to get into more. There's more on this slide than that topic, but that comes from, again, that study of the book of Zechariah. In ephah, the question earlier, a standard unit of commercial dry measure. So here it is, a basket. You can see a bushel. We're familiar with a, court, a, a pint, a quart, etc. And bushel is, I think, what we probably use most of in, in our day to measure. But... Uh, here's an, uh, so an ephah is a standard unit of commercial dry measure. Ten times the size of an omar. Does that help you? Well, that's in Exodus 16.36. So it's about uh, the equivalent of 1.05 bushels. So familiar, familiar with the bushel, 
it's about 1.05 of that. So one bushel is approximately 56 pounds, right? So that's what a, a, an ephah is. And they have a talent. Standard commercial measure of weight, approximately 75 to 108 pounds, okay? Now, in this vision, we saw these two women that had wings of a stork. Well, if you're familiar with clean and unclean animals and the categories thereof, a stork was what? Without looking on the slide to cheat, what's a stork? An unclean animal, right? Stork is unclean. So it's not kosher. So you have this woman that's depicting wickedness put into an ephah, and you have two women with wings of a stork, unclean birds picking this thing up and moving it over to the, the plain of Shinar. Do you see, are some dots connecting here? And you, we see here that the woman is inside of the ephah trapped, right, with a, with a lid of lead. And it's being moved over to Shinar, and you get the impression it's trapped until a time. And what is that time? Well, it's Revelation 17 and 18. When wickedness... The woman is going to be judged when this pagan, idolatry, uh, religious, and commercial system is finally going to be judged. So, uh, the stork is not clean, not kosher. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus eleven thirteen. And these are they which ye shall have in abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten. They are in abomination. The eagle and the offridge and the osprey and the vulture and the kite after his kind, every raven after his kind, and the owl and the night hawk and the cockle and the hawk after his kind, and the little owl and the cormont and the great owl, and the swan, and the pelican, and the gyre eagle, and the stork. Right? And I'll stop right there. And the stork. So here we see evil. I'm not sorry, evil. Uh, 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 unclean, not kosher. And here you can see a woman uh, in a basket. And then you have two other women that apparently are carrying it. Over to Shinar. Because Zechariah was where? Yeah, Jerusalem. So carrying this thing over to Shinar. Shinar equals Babel. Nimrod, which in a previous tangent we took a look at. Nimrod, the first world's dictator. Uh, Noah's great grandson. Babel, the gateway to the heavens. It becomes Babylon. Babel becomes Babylon. You can see that there. There's just a lot of history and a lot of stuff that happened thousands of years ago that is going to have its conclusion. Remember Genesis, the book of beginnings, and Revelation, where things that began are going to have their conclusion. And in this case, the final judgment of Babylon. So conjecture. The strange vision in Zechariah potentially suggests a time will come when a global power will shift the commercial and pagan religious power center of the planet Earth will occur, migrating back to its original site at literal Babylon, where it will finally be judged. Conjecture. Right? It's conjecture. But Babylon was the center of rel pagan religious power and uh, commercial the ephah and the talent were the standard commercial measurements of volume and weight, respectively. The woman in Zechariah represents a system of wickedness. The woman of Zechariah 5, 7, uh, chapter 5, verse 7, equals the woman of Revelation 17, verses 3 through 6. The two carriers had wings of a stork, which is an unclean bird. Echoes of Matthew 13 and Revelation 2. 
what is the next bookmark that I have here? It is not that, but you could look those up. All right, that ends chapter 18. So now we'll go to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19. And after these things, meta tauta again, and after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornications, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again he said, they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, the four beasts, these are the same 24 elders that we saw at the very you know, beginning. We've been looking, or we've been seeing, crossing paths with these 24 elders throughout our study of the book of Revelation, right? That, and then we've also seen this reoccurrence of the appearance of the four beasts, which are what? Who can remind us what these four beasts are? They're a, cat, a rank of angel. Starts with a C. Cherubim. And who can remind us how many faces do the cherubim have? Four faces. And what are those four faces? Okay, man. Lion. Eagle. Not a bear, an ox. Man, ox, eagle, and lion. And in the previous tangent, we looked at those four faces. Where do we see those four faces in other places in the Bible? They were the four insignia of the four dominant tribes as they were wandering around the desert and would set up camp when the Shekinah glory would stop. The Shekinah glory being the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. And when it would stop, Israel would set up camp. And the very center of camp was what? The tabernacle. Right? The tabernacle was the temporary place before the permanent temple was built in which the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat would go, right? And then you'd have the camps around it and it formed... Their camp formed a cross in the desert. How many recall that conversation? And then that camp of the four sides had those same four insignia. Is that a coincidence? Is that just pure happenstance? That the four insignia happened to match the four faces of the cherubim. And then, if you go further, we also looked at, we don't have time to do it now this morning, but we looked at how those same four are present. We see those in what? The four, four Gospels, exactly. How many remember that? When we looked at the, each of the four Gospels has a different target audience, has different emphases throughout it. And, they, and they're presenting the Messiah in different manner based on the target audience. And because of the target audience, different emphases. So one of them presents Christ as a man. And the genealogy goes back to the first man, right? Who's who? Adam. One of them presents Christ as the suffering servant. Because that's what he was, right? A suffering servant. And what was the genealogy in that presentation? There was no genealogy because nobody cares about the genealogy of a servant, right? Then another presents Christ as the Messiah. And that's the Messiah, the Savior of Israel. And then that genealogy goes back to who? Abraham, the most venerated Jew, right? So it traces that because it's presenting him as a Jew, 
And the Messiah for Israel, he, it's obviously going to trace him back to the most venerated Jew, Abraham. Okay, then the last gospel presents the Messiah how? As the Son of God. And in that gene, what is the genealogy in that presentation? The pre existent one. So three of the Gospels have genealogies, one of them doesn't. And the one that doesn't is the one that where he's being presented as a servant. Isn't that awesome? And so what is the servant, just to give an example? A servant of those four faces we looked at, which of those is the servant face? The ox, because it was a beast of burden, right? I said we wouldn't do this, but I'm doing it anyway. So the presentation of Christ as a man, which of the four faces do you think would be associated with a man? Probably the man, right? Okay, one of them presents him as the Messiah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So which of the four faces do you think that gospel then is associated with? The lion, right? And then lastly, one of the gospels, the gospel of John, the whole purpose of the gospel of John is to present Christ as the Son of God, the pre-existent one. And so of those four faces, which of the faces is associated with deity? The eagle. Isn't that fascinating? Pure coincidence, right? Absolutely not, because coincidence is not a kosher word. All of Scripture is an integrated message. It's an integrated message. And our creator, the same creator, that has the capability to call things into existence. You know, we as humanity, we are discovering, or we discovered chemistry, we discovered biology and astronomy, right? The wonderments. So we're discovering them, but, the, but our creator created them from nothing, right? And so the point that I put forward to the skeptics and scoffers is, or for those who might be having their, their faith challenged with the integrity of the text, the same creator that has the capability to create calculus and create chemistry has the capability to preserve his text throughout time against hostile attack, against those that seek to change the message, edit the message, right? It's been preserved throughout time because the same creator that can create chemistry can preserve his word, right? Well, let's continue reading. So chapter 19, verse 4, And the four and twenty elders and four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters. Right? I'm just thinking of a waterfall. I've not been to Niagara Falls, but has anybody been to Niagara Falls? Right? For those who have, could you imagine trying to have a shouting match? Right? Or trying to argue with Niagara Falls, right? But that's what this voice is, like the voice of many waters. And as the voice of mighty thunderings. <laughs> I know we've all been through a, a pretty, you know, a loud rainstorm, right? With some pretty loud thunder. Could you imagine trying to argue with these loud, with loud thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord our God omnipotent. <laughs> why am I not able to say that right now? Omnipotent reigneth. I'll say that again. Saying, Alleluia, for the Lord our God omnipotent reigneth. What is omnipotent? Unlimited power, right? Unlimited power. 
Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Who's the, what's the marriage lamb? Who's that? Well, the lamb is Christ. The bride, the wife, having made herself ready, is us. And so the marriage of the lamb, are we married to Christ right now? What is our present state right now? What's our, yes, we're betrothed. Right now, we're in a betrothal period. Right now, that's our relationship between us as the bride and our bridegroom Christ. The marriage has not yet occurred. That's still coming. Verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, this is that angel now speaking to John, Right blessed are they that are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. For he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, Thou, see thou, do it not. We see several examples of humans encountering angels throughout Scripture, right? And, and in many of those encounters, I think in nearly every one of those encounters, there's, there's fear, right? Uh, many times the angel says, fear not. And I'm sure that most of us would be in that position if we encountered an angel, uh, some kind of a spiritual being. We're likely going to be afraid. How many think here that you wouldn't be afraid? Just curious, how many are going to be courageous? And so, but fear not. I've not had one of those experiences. Or if I have, I was unaware, right? Because we do entertain angels unaware, right? That much we know. Because angels can manifest themselves not necessarily as a, uh, an outward appearance of some kind of light being. But when, if we do encounter one like that, we, we see fear not. But in many cases, we also see humans attempting to worship. And that's how you know when you encounter an angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, you can see, does it, do the humans who are encountering this angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, do they respond by attempting to worship? And does the angel allow them to? In most cases, the angel stops them, like we see right here. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Boy, there is a lot going on here. The testimony of Jesus is the, is the spirit of prophecy, but we'll come back to that. But just to finish his point, so this, the angel saying, I am a fellow servant. Don't worship me, worship God. And we see that in the Old Testament numerous times. But there are a handful of times when the angel not only doesn't, that's a double negative, doesn't, doesn't not stop it, but actually uh, commands it. What is one such encounter? Joshua, take off your shoes, you're in hollow ground. What's another encounter? Moses, is there another encounter? Abraham. So the angel of the Lord comes and stops Abraham. Abraham from sacrificing his son. And what does the angel of the Lord say in that moment? Now I know you have not withheld your only son Isaac from who? From me. Well, what does that mean? Abraham wasn't sacrificing Isaac to an angel so the me that Abraham encountered in that moment was who? A pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Right? What do we call that? 
Christophany. Yep. Verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called the faithful, was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And his eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. So verse 11 here, this is a white horse, and we've, out, we've encountered horse and horsemen earlier in the book of Revelation, right? How many were though? How many did we encounter? Four. So this is the fifth horseman, right? Could you say these are the, this is the fifth horseman of the apocalypse? Absolutely you could. Absolutely. Most of us are familiar with the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? But this would be the fifth horseman of the apocalypse. Verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him, upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. <whistles> Certainly wouldn't want to be on that end of the wrath of God, right? Whenever we encounter grapes and wine presses and the running out of the Jews, we see this several times in Scripture, what is that a picture of? Judgment, blood, yeah. When you squeeze the grape, the juice runs out. When you squeeze a person, what's going to run out? A gory scene of blood. And as we see here, this is the day of the Lord. Specifically, what is the day of the Lord? The day of vengeance of our God. The prophecy that Christ stopped at a comma and didn't read. He did not complete the sentence. Christ stopped at a comma. He closed the book, remember? And everybody in the synagogue was looking at him. The part after the comma was, and the day of vengeance of our God. This is that day. This is that moment. And in the day of vengeance of our God, do you think there's going to be a shedding of blood of the enemies of God? Yeah. Yeah. Look what it says here. I mean, again, this is, I just want, I want to make sure this is coming across in the English, that it's not sanitized for us. We spoke earlier about the harlot and the whore, not terms we generally are using in pleasant company. But this is another one. This is not sanitized. The, there is blood spatter, splattering right now. And it, it even goes so far as to describe, uh, where did I see that? Verse 13, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And there was so, there is, in this day of the Lord, with judgment being executed, and this spilling of blood, the crushing of people, the blood is literally splattering so much that it's all over his clothes. And it looks like he's taken his garment and dipped it in blood. That's how John is describing this. Do you see that? Is that, is that coming across in the English for you? Okay, verse... Let's go to... We were in... Verse 16. And he, saith, and he hath on his vesture of his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, in case there was any confusion as to who is enacting the judgment here. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together for unto the supper of the great God. Yikes. So in this day of wrath, with all these dead bodies, the fowls are going to come and eat on the, the flesh of the corpse that are laying around, apparently. Verse 18, That ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and all them that sat on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse 
and against his army. I mean, this is just, it's so absurd. I don't know what delusion they have over their eyes or what cloudiness they have in their mind. They're actually going to, who is this rider? Who is this fifth horseman? Christ, it was identified right there for us. And his name is, and on his thigh was written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is, Dennis is two minutes early. He's giving me a two-minute warning. He gave me a 100% increase in the warning time. So it's identified for us. And yet, these kings of the earth in this time are gathering themselves together to do what? To make war against the creator. It's just so absurd. But nevertheless, it's going to happen. Yes. Yep. Yeah, with a strong delusion, yeah. Notice how they're both white. But remember, Satan doesn't have any original ideas. Everything he does is a counterfeit. So with Christ riding a white horse, here you see the Antichrist riding, riding a white horse. I mean, the whole, his whole uh, scheme throughout humanity is, is a counterfeit everything. Verse 20, And the beast was was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image so there's the image there was the beast and his image that were worshiped by those who took the mark and these are all uh the the right of the fifth horseman here is who is christ is is enacting judgment and all of these people these both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls filled with their flesh. Wow. That ends chapter 19, yes. This is, the, well, it's leading up to it, but yes. Yeah, it is the battle, because they're all, ga- yes, it is. They all gather themselves together to fight against him. So yes, this is the judgment. This is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. All right. What are three things quickly that you learned? We are out of time, so we don't have time to hesitantly raise your hand. Yes. Christ has many crowns. The Antichrist, the pseudo Christ, has one crown. What are two more things that the Holy Spirit brought to your mind this morning? Four faces of the Old Testament are in the four Gospels. Yep, emphasized based on the presentation of the Messiah. All right, what's one more thing? The woman in the basket with the ten horns. Yeah, the woman in the basket in the vision in Zechariah is the same as the woman, the wickedness, the evil, the harlot of Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Absolutely. Well, with that, let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for giving us this time together. And Lord, we are so grateful to learn about you, and Lord, we would ask that you make manifest in our minds what you would have us to do for your work. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and we want to purpose ourselves and our lives to fulfill what you would have for us as you grant us the privilege of being a participant in your plan, that you're actively working. And we ask, Lord, that you be with Preacher this morning in the message and with the relationship and copy social. In the name, power, and in the authority of Jesus Christ, amen.